tonight's presentation is uh, campus workers organizing around debt, practical ideas and resources. Um, and I'm just gonna give a quick, um, so first of all, I forgot introductions last time. So um, I'm Tracy Berger. I am a business analyst in IT at the University of Colorado Boulder. And um, I'm part of United Campus Workers Colorado as well. Um, and uh, we'll be talking a little bit later about what our union has done um, as far as organizing around debt and uh, austerity. Um, so uh, this group started about a year ago. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, it's totally screwed. Um, uh, and we've been meeting and organizing and um, getting, uh, figuring out ways to organize around debt and simplify the issue of debt and uh, bring in uh, people to this conversation. Um, and that included the Debt Reveal Day um, that was April 15th of this year. Um, and uh, these talks and other things that we're working on um, for the future. Um, we've created resources to expose institutions' debt burdens, and we're hoping to expand both interest in and organization around these issues. Um, so just what is university debt? I think you probably have an idea if you're here, but in case you don't, um, university debt is a, um, a way of funding uh, public education, public higher education. Um, it's also, it's it's the same thing as municipal debt, which is used by cities and counties and localities and uh, school districts and um, other public organizations to fund public services by publicly releasing debt so that, that people can um, then not people and like mutual funds and hedge funds and uh, larger institutions can then purchase um, parts of these universities debt and they get paid back over time with interest. Um, and uh, these, the institutional debt is um, based, uh, the, the terms of the debt are based on a couple of things um, that are problematic for us. Um, and one of those is the uh, credit rating agencies decide uh, based on, you know, if there's a AAA rating for a university, that university gets lower interest rates and better terms. Um, and in order to get that high, and there are very few that have a AAA, but the, um, the in order to get a high uh, credit rating from these credit rating agencies, uh, need, universities need to basically follow a neoliberal um, model. And these agencies go in and meet with, uh, they meet directly with the finance people at the university. They have private meetings, they get private uh, documents that nobody really sees. And we don't, there's a lot, there's a lack of transparency there. Um, and universities are also highly motivated to make decisions around their finances and they, trickle down to like what academic programs to keep and which ones to get rid of, how uh, hiring practices work, things like that um, can all end up being uh, connected to the, uh, the credit, rate, credit rating agencies. And then um, institutional debt is also, if you look at the terms of institutional debt, um, you can see that it's dependent on student tuition and fees and that universities are in general um, committed to keep their tuition and fees high enough to sustain their debt burden, um, which means, again, this neoliberal practice of funding higher education through uh, students and parents where yeah. uh, it's not, um, not the way that public education was originally intended to function. So the plan for tonight is uh, we're going to hear from campus workers who are organizing against debt and for full funding. Um, and we will then workshop the first steps or next steps, depending on where you're at, of organizing on your campuses. So um, the next piece that we're going to do is a breakout. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll yep. pick up there. Thanks, Tracy. 
Um, so I'm Barbara Mataloni. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I am uh, with Labor Notes, uh, which is an education and publication project that works on uh, uh, supporting rank and file union members to build more democratic, uh, transparent, and militant unions. And uh, Labor Notes has been supporting the work of the Public Higher Education Workers Network over the last two years as we bring campus workers together uh, to learn how to reclaim our universities uh, through worker organizing. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask you uh, to take a few minutes uh, to get in some uh, breakout groups and um, talk to each other about the last conversation that you had about debt. And uh, when I say that, um, I don't mean like go through and find the last conversation that you had necessarily about university debt, uh, because debt is widespread. Taxi drivers in uh, New York City are on a hunger strike right now because of the debt that taxi drivers are in, uh, uh, having bought their medallions. Uh, students on our campuses are in debt, uh, uh, and uh, students off our campuses are in debt. Uh, so uh, this is a real question for you to think about and talk to each other about uh, the last conversation you had about debt in whichever form you've experienced that conversation. Uh, we want to start to think about how we talk about debt and how we don't talk about debt in this country. Uh, so I'm going to get you into breakout rooms. If you uh, don't get an invitation, I will give you one shortly. Uh, because we got folks hopping in as we speak. Uh, so I'm going to give you about five or six minutes to talk about that. Go ahead. Ariel, did you not get an invitation? Great, welcome back. Uh, sorry to cut off any conversations that we cut off. Um, if, since it's a small group, uh, if we're going to ask some questions and if anything to say, just go ahead and unmute. If that gets unruly, uh, raise your Zoom hand and we'll do it that way. Um, but curious uh, if anybody wants to share some of what you heard uh, in terms of what it was like to have a conversation about that. What were people discussing? What did they share? And what did they share about what it was like to have that conversation? I can take a turn. I mean, I, I think it, it I, I shared that I, um, I work as an adjunct professor at um, a couple different private universities in San Francisco and um, so have been learning a lot and thinking a lot about institutional debt and the role of adjunct labor in, um, in those kinds of business models. So I've become, I've, I'm in the habit of, of really, um, of bringing students into the conversation around, you know, their student loan and how their student loan is also tied to institutional debt. Um, and I think every time I talk about it with them, Right, it destigmatizes the conversation and is just, I think it's really liberating to talk about. Thank you. Destigmatizing. Because there's something we have to destigmatize about talking about our debt, uh, our personal debt in particular, uh, but any debt, we're gonna talk some about uh, the myths. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. Someone else 
you want to talk about what you heard uh, in your conversation or what you said? I'll pipe Go up. Ahead, Kathleen. Um, I, I shared that that anytime I talk about debt, it it comes with a a healthy dose of negativity. That that it's bad to have so much credit card debt, and um, you know, just it's it's something to be ashamed of uh, for for so many people. Um, in in I'm getting over that at this point. Um, I'm, and now I'm getting mad at the people who are capitalizing on, on my oh, debt. Yeah. Um, but uh, we shared stories of, uh, of um, student loan debt. Um, uh, my son had, has uh, 60,000 odd dollars in student loans from his master's of library science. And we've taken it on because the jobs that he got after graduating couldn't you know, couldn't match his payments. He couldn't pay for rent and food and student loans. So now my husband and I are paying his student loans. So it's kind of crushing. <laughs> yeah, uh, crushing uh, materially and uh, crushing psychically uh, because we've been, we've been taught to blame ourselves. Uh, and, um, and be ashamed, as you say, that uh, in a world of profound injustice, uh, we've had to take on debt in order to make a, a life for ourselves. Thank you, Kathleen. Anyone else? Building on what Kathleen said, our group talked a little bit about student debt and how it impacts life choices of students after graduation. Um, and we specifically talked about um, li librarians, because I specifically know a few people who train to be librarians and have a really hard time with their student loans. Um, and uh, it's, it's, there's this decision that's being made between, do I want to go to school, first of all, for the thing that I'm passionate about? And then do I want to work in the area that I'm passionate about? Um, or do I need to make choices based on paying back these student loans and making rent and all of these other obligations. Yeah, it's amazing how it, student debt constricts life choices in a really profound way. Anyone else? I guess I'll just quickly report that we agree, we did talk about the shame of debt, but also just how pervasive it is. And um, Liz, I think you had mentioned new forms of debt. So, you know, new products that are available. So you can get in, you know, 20, 30, $40,000 in debt for fertility treatments. And people now are dying in a state of, you know, they're, they're, assets are less than their debts, and that's just normative. So it's amazing, right? Like, it is common. It is something that we actually share, that, that unless you uh, are incredibly privileged, you, in order to enter the world and manage, you take on debt of one sort or another. And yet, we are ashamed of it as if it's an individual uh, uh, failing on our part, rather than that the world is constructed so that we don't have enough uh, in order to, to, you know, the rich get richer and we take out debt. And when we take out debt, who benefits? The rich, uh, because they're profiting uh, off their rent seeking. So I think it's important, um, to sort of name that, and a couple of you, uh, Elizabeth and Kathleen, both sort of alluded to like coming to understand who you have to be angry at, <clears throat> that we've been taught <clears throat> to blame ourselves, uh, hide ourselves, when in fact what we want to do is flip it and say this is about injustice, and we should not be in this position, uh, and 
there should be a public good that is shared and available for all of us that we do not have to take on debt in order to have the life that we need. And the only way we're gonna do, do that is to stop understanding it as an individual issue and understand it as a systemic and structural issue that we have to take on with collective power. And what we're here to talk about tonight is how do we help others reorient themselves to debt uh, as a problem of the system that we have to dismantle? Uh, and how do we then orient also with that reorientation, uh, bring people together to take collective action? And in particular, to do that in the context of higher education uh, as a right that uh, for all of us, not just that we should have it, but that it should be fully funded uh, in, in all of its uh, potential. So that's where we're gonna go tonight uh, with this. Um, so thanks very much for the conversation. And I think I'm gonna pass it over to Jason, who's gonna introduce our next speaker, who's gonna help us hear a story about how this is possible. Yeah, thank you, Barbara, and thank you, everyone. Um, before I introduce Andrew Ross, I did want to mention a debt struggle that's going on right now that uh, hopefully people are aware of or can become more aware of. So in Puerto Rico right now, students across the island are striking. Um, there's mass movements against debt austerity against the, the universities there. And so if you get a chance to look into what's happening in Puerto Rico right now, I think it's directly related insofar as you have universities that are being gutted across the nation. What's interesting about the situation in Puerto Rico is that you have tens of thousands of students coming together to organize against that. And uh, a question is like, what would it take to do that in the United States here on the mainland? Um, what are the factors that go into that? I'm gonna share a video about student organizing that was made last year, um, I think in 2019. So if anyone's interested in more and about what's happening in Puerto Rico, this is a good video to see how some of the organizing happened there around debt. Um, Along those lines, uh, I'm going to introduce Andrew Ross, who is a longtime uh, debt organizer, um, one of the original members of Strike Debt that came out of Occupy um, Wall Street, and Strike Debt later became the Debt Collective. Um, but just before I do that, the reason why we wanted to uh, have Andrew say a few words here was because one of the things that we're up against is a narrative around like the types of demands that we make. And so if we're making demands that universities should be debt free, that we should cancel Wall Street, a lot of people are going to say, you're fucking crazy. That makes no sense. There's no way that's going to happen. This is ludicrous. This is pie in the sky. And what's interesting, and I, what Andrew will highlight, is that when Andrew and other people started to call for debt strikes during Occupy Wall Street, for student debt, they were ridiculed in the same way they weren't taken seriously and so forth. And so what we were hoping that Andrew could do for us is kind of tell us the, the arc of how like the once, you know, quote unquote, ludicrous demand to cancel student debt is now become quite mainstream. So without further ado, uh, pass it over to friend and comrade Andrew Ross. Thanks, Andrew, for, for agreeing to say a few words with us. Sure. Thank you, Jason. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I am uh, happy to say a few words here, especially about institutional debt, because it's, it's such an important topic. And for the most part, it's not on the radar of most commentators uh, who are focused on the fiscal challenges facing uh, higher ed, which is really frustrating. Um, I'd say, you know, most higher ed employees are acutely aware of how public funding cuts have impacted our institutions. But I think the prevailing assumption is that administrators make up the shortfall by either growing their student body or increasing tuition fees. And um, most employees or colleagues are relatively unaware of how deep in the hole administrators are prepared to go through borrowing. I mean, either through bond issues or, or directly from Wall Street. And in every instance, the net outcome is the same. It's a, a greater burden on individual student debt and it's a squeezing of employee wages, salaries, and benefits. 
And so while the story about student debt, I think, has been very well narrated and is now a fixture in the public mind, and I'll get to that in a minute, as Jason, uh, uh, Jason wanted me to, um, the same is not yet true of institutional debt, uh, nor of its corrosive impact on employee pay packets. But from an organizing perspective, however, I would say that the prospects for the latter are actually brighter and stronger than in the case of student debt. Now, why should that be the case? Um, first of all, because you know, for all of the successes of the student debt movement, organizing in campus itself has been very weak. And this is largely because of the psychology of the student debtor. We found that, that this psychology works to defer all of the anxiety and resentment and outrage until after graduation, you know, when, <laughs> when students actually have to start paying back their debts. Um, so that means that campus organizing has been actually weaker or minimal. And this is what we found over the decade of organizing ourselves. And um, so I started out as a Jason uh, mentioned as one of the founders of the Occupy Student Debt Campaign almost exactly 10 years ago. And also, uh, I'm a founding member of the Debt Collective, which we both belong to, Jason and I, and which continues the work. When we launched uh, the Occupy Student Debt Campaign, it was not an entirely new campaign. We were actually drawing on the work of Adolf Reed, who had made tuition-free college uh, one of the planks of the Labour Party, uh, which for those of you who don't know, the Labour Party was relatively short-lived. It was founded in 1996 by several progressive unions, active only for a few years, but uh, Adolf made tuition-free college one of the central planks. And, uh, and so we picked that up and, and ran with it as one of the demands of our campaign. And yes, we did make demands, uh, despite the consensus in Occupy at the time that no demands should be made. <laughs> we made demands from the very beginning, and of course they included tuition free, they included a debt jubilee, and they were uh, considered pretty outlandish uh, ideas um, by the public media, and, and certainly they were far outside of the so-called Overton window you know, which is the, the range of policy ideas that's considered acceptable within the political mainstream at any one time. Uh, for example, I remember doing an op-ed, uh, or, or pitching an op-ed for the New York Times, um, and the editor uh, told me that this kind of stuff will never happen. So it's, it's not even worthwhile floating it as an opinion piece. This is sort of classic uh, New York Times gatekeeping, right? <laughs> um, well, we know that these ideas and these demands turned out to be very, very popular. I mean, which parents would not want their kids to go to a quality tuition-free university? I mean, zero, uh, zero parents. And so over time and, and through the cumulative work of small successor groups like Strike Debt and the, and the Debt Collective, uh, these, we've moved these ideas from the very margin of political discourse to the very forefront. Um, and over the last few years, these ideas have become, you know, among, among the leading policy commitments um, of the Democratic Party, or at least there's a lot of rhetoric which suggests that they, they can and should be leading policy commitments. Of course, the fact that they've only recently arrived um, uh, at, at that level of elevated attention means that they're also on the chopping block in the current wrangling over the Democrats' reconciliation bill. But uh, even if they are cut out of that bill, and it's quite possible they will be, they're not going to go away. Uh, they're not going to go back to the margin. So the story of the student debt movement, I think, is a very good case study. In, in, in how quickly uh, a very left field idea uh, can be converted into a, um, an established policy standpoint. And, and, and it can be done through strategic organizing of a relatively small number of people. So the question is then, can institutional debt follow the same path? 
um, why not? <laughs> um, I've always argued it shouldn't that, and, and the debtors union created by the debt collects because that's what we are, uh, is a natural extension of the labor movement because debts are the wages of the future. They're promised far in advance of the labor that earns those wages. But, it, it, but that's kind of indirect and, and sort of abstract for some people. Institutional debt, however, seems to me to be much more directly in labor's wheelhouse. And if the higher ed unions can get behind it, it should go faster and it should go further. And because we're talking about um, you know, the financial health of large institutions, which collectively impact hundreds and thousands of employees, it makes it much more difficult to channel the issue into a matter of individual morality. And this is what often and, and sometimes always happens with the skewed discussions of student debt, that they revolve around the moral responsibility of individuals for their financial decisions. That is not uh, the terrain on which uh, the institutional debt movement uh, will founder. <laughs> And we'll probably want to have to deal with that because uh, it's, it's not so much of an issue. Uh, but uh, it, it has to be clear that there is a direct correlation between institutional educational debt and, and personal education debt. How could there not be? And yet that relationship uh, is obscured in the public mind and it should be said, uh, also in the minds of many members of the academic workforce. So there's a lot, of, a lot of work to be done in consciousness raising on that front. Finally, and, and this does not go without saying, unlike with student debt, the unions are already there. Uh, the warm bodies are already in the room of dialogue. Maybe the dialogue hasn't started yet, but the warm bodies are in the room. So that hard work of building unions which we've tried to do with the Debt Collective, uh, doesn't need to be done. Uh, from an organizing perspective, that means that more than half the battle, maybe 60% of the battle is already won. Uh, but of course, as we know, the other 40% will, will still be a heavy lift. lift. It will require uh, innovative strategy and tactics. And, and I, for one, I'm looking forward to being part of it. So thank you for inviting me and uh, look forward to this conversation. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, it's always great to hear from you and it's always educational on so many levels. And uh, thank you for everything you've done over the, you know, so many years. It's, it's really an honor. Um, so I wanna now introduce some folks who maybe to, to build on what Andrew was saying, which I think is really optimistic and uh, on a lot of levels, like we're up against some big giants, right? But there's, it's, you know, I think Andrew gives us a, a nice lens to, to view this battle through. Um, so I wanna introduce some folks that are, have already started to do debt organizing uh, against institutional debt um, in some really creative and I think powerful ways. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Zoe from CUNY, uh, Rich and Joanna from the Massachusetts system and Tracy from Colorado. And they're gonna talk about some of the stuff that they've been doing in their, um, on their campuses and around their campuses around this question of institutional debt, because it's through these examples of what uh, some of our colleagues and comrades are doing that we can learn how to build power across a variety of different uh, locales and adopt a variety of tactics to take up the struggle that Andrew was just talking about. So um, Zoe, I'm gonna turn it over to you. It's really good to see you again. Uh, we met Zoe in a park doing a really good speech on institutional debt in front of Chuck Schumer's uh, building. So uh, really good to see you again. And um, from Zoe, we'll go to uh, Joanna and Rich and then we'll go to Tracy. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jason. And I'll just mention that my colleague from CUNY, Leanne is also here. So if I miss anything in, in this account, she might jump in and fill in some gaps. Um, but yeah, basically I'm from CUNY, I'm a grad student. Um, uh, I'm both studying and teaching uh, on campus. And um, for those who don't know, the union at CUNY, the PSC is a wall-to-wall -wall union. We have 30,000 members. Um, so 
lots of bargaining power, but also, you know, a lot of people to try to organize and mobilize. Um, and I should say that um, the union is made up of tenured faculty, of uh, graduate students, of librarians, of administrators. So there are a lot of different interest groups. And what is so great about the question of institutional debt is that everyone has a stake in it. Um, you know, previously with, with issues around student debt, which obviously as, uh, as Andrew Ross and others have mentioned, while it is mutually imbricated with institutional debt, if we're really trying to get people who are a little less enthusiastic about political action or people who maybe occupy less precarious positions in the university, bringing up institutional debt gets them a little more riled up. Um, so basically we went about it just by creating a committee in our union. Um, this was really still, you know, pen, like the, uh, the very dire time of the pandemic, um, though I recognize, of course, that it's, it's still dire. So all of our meetings were on Zoom. They were conducted online, which presented a bit of a, a challenge. Um, and I'd be curious to you know, hear about people's experiences organizing now as campuses are kind of returning to more in-person uh, courses and, and modalities. But we did everything online. Um, I will also say that it's not as challenging as it looks. I went in very intimidated as someone who is unfamiliar um, with the math and the bureaucracy and that kind of investigative research. But um, we were really helped by the Debt Collective, um, which organized workshops um, throughout the semester. So we were able to go to the workshops, ask questions of people, um, we were also helped by the fact that because CUNY is public, all of its budget documents are available. Um, and frankly, like many of the numbers we were looking for, you'd think they'd try to hide it um, a little more in a more sophisticated manner, but they, a lot of them were just right there, stayed on the budget. Um, so it actually, it obviously took some digging, um, but I, I really think that anyone can do it, any group of people. Um, provided that you have the enthusiasm and the sort of organizational structure, anyone can do it. Um, and we kind of ended with, uh, during Debt Reveal Day, we had a big presentation that was online. And then I actually participated in a walking tour of uh, Hunter College, which is a CUNY campus. And that was actually really great because that involved student organizations. Um, and that was one of the big, goals we had was just not, not only to kind of spread this information and diffuse it through faculty and workers, but also get students um, interested and engaged. And one of the things that really helped with that is we were able to show them these sort of interesting statistics that were like, you know, this percentage of your tuition actually goes to servicing CUNY's debt. Or if we didn't have CUNY's debt, we would have, I think the number was, we would be able to hire 2000 full-time faculty members. Um, and those numbers are really astonishing. And they are, those are sort of the figures that get students excited. So I don't wanna go on too long, but um, all that is just to say, I'm also like available uh, to answer any questions. Leanne also knows just as much as I do and, and might have something to say as well. Leanne, I don't know how you're feeling. Yeah, thank you so much, Zoe. Um, yeah, I just um, wanted to uh, say that uh, well, yeah, really grateful to the State Collective for um, giving us the opportunity to learn from them and organize with them. Um, and uh, this exercise um, is really also an opportunity for us to um, uh, think about these numbers as telling a story and flipping the script um, and um, helping us get a hold of um, what our institutional priorities actually are. And um, you know, from researching the debt, it actually helped us think a lot more about um, how the austerity predated COVID um, and think about campus security budgets. Um, and um, eventually we actually, um, part of our debt, leading up to our debt um, field day, we actually had um, a list of 10 budget facts um, uh, that uh, we were able to put together. So yeah, thank you all. Thank you so much, Zoe and Leanne. Um, I want to allow, if people have uh, maybe one question after each of these great examples, I mean, there's so much to talk about. 
after hearing from Zoe and Leanne. So maybe if we can have at least one question that someone might want to ask, either like clarifying question or just a, a more general question. Um, let's allow a moment for that. So does anyone have a question they would they, they would like to ask Zoe and Leanne about their organizing around institutional debt at CUNY? And either just raise your hand or speak up or put your name in stack. So Aaron, go ahead. Thanks. I was just curious if you could say more about the walking tour and how you mobilize the student body to support. I think uh, I'm at Wayne State. I think we'd be interested in, in doing similar stuff, but some more detail would be helpful. Thanks. Yeah, so I should say that actually our committee didn't organize that uh, walking tour. It was organized by a group called Free CUNY, um, which mobilizes around these kinds of issues. Um, and has been really vocal, especially about trying to reduce campus security um, and their presence at CUNY. And what's so great about Free CUNY is it has both students and faculty members um, as part of the group. So I think there were faculty members on our committee who were already working with Free CUNY and there was just kind of a natural overlap there um, and they got to hearing about what we were doing and we were hearing about what they were doing and they came up with this idea of a walking tour. Um, so I guess sort of the, the kind of concrete advice I could give is if there are any kind of interest groups that involve both students and workers, um, those are really good places to start. All right, um, really quickly, Andrew Lusk and then Andrew Ross, two questions and two quick responses, and then we'll do the same thing for the next, uh, for the next round too. So Andrew Lusk, if you could introduce yourself too by saying your name and where you're coming from, either, you know, it doesn't have to be an institution, just where you are in the world, that'd be great. You're up, Andrew Lusk. Did we lose Andrew? Oh no. I think he, he pressed the wrong button. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he must have. He'll be back. Okay, Andrew Ross, go for it. Oh yeah, just very quickly. Um, I'm just wondering how transparent you found the the data uh, on your institutional and institutional debt, and this could really go for any of the speakers. Uh, obviously, it, at a public university, a lot of the data is more available, but there's always stuff that's hidden, right? And I'm, I'm curious to know if you if you came across that the same pattern. Yeah, um, we the the audits were all um, readily available, and um, the budgets were also. Um, but actually, an area that we're looking into in the future is looking at CARES Act money, um, and where that's going, and that. Even though they are required to report that quarterly, um, the buckets that they are reporting, um, you know, this is at you know, scales of like tens of millions of dollars, is very vague and um, very suspicious. So, okay. so certainly, certainly an area of future research and organizing. Thank you, Andrew Lusk. You're back with us. Tell us your hey. question. Where you're coming from? Thank you. I'm so sorry. I have a terrible internet connection, but I switched to hotspot. So can everyone hear me? Am I still coming through? Okay, good. Um, hi, I'm Andy, and uh, I was recently involved in the uh, NYU grad worker strike. Um, I helped out with that, but unfortunately, I had already graduated at that time. And I'm here today to learn a little bit about how to get involved with organizing, even if I'm not, you know, technically affiliated with an institution anymore, or how to like reconnect with people at NYU or other universities or Kind of expand into that world. Uh, Andy, I think at, I think at some point we can put up um, some possibilities in the chat of different groups that you can look into, and then if you want to follow up with us, we can we can talk about that and via email uh, at at any time. Awesome! Thank you Thanks so much. For, thank you, thank you for joining us and for hopping back on Hotspot and all. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Leanne. And I want to turn it over now to Rich and Joanna um, to talk a little bit about some of their work in Massachusetts.
Thanks, Jason. Um, my name is Joanna Gonzalez. I'm um, from Salem State University and with my colleague, Rich Levy. We're going to split our time and just sort of tell the story of um, our organizing uh, journey that we've been on around uh, uh, university debt. And my portion will really just talk about what's our entry point into these discussions and into this business of organizing around debt. And it began actually two years ago. Um, we were starting to feel um, really the palpable impacts of you know, in Massachusetts decades of austerity. Um, our, our tuition and fees was you know, getting really high. Students were working too much. There was a habitual lack of resources and just always inadequate you know, levels of funding. And um, so at the time, we just felt we need more money from the, the Commonwealth to fix our problems. Uh, we borrowed an idea actually uh, from one of our sister campuses. And it's, it's, a, it's a neat idea to start conversations, which was we held a, uh, our union organized it. It was a teaching. Um, it was called you know, the Financial Crisis in, uh, on Massachusetts Public Campuses. And our attention was really focused on you know, rising tuition, student debt burdens. Um, and, and the students really enjoyed being able to talk about their debt, the impacts of debt, about how um, this was all getting in the way of their education and was going to have lifelong impacts. Um, the teach on really took off and we ended up having 125 classes um, that participated. Uh, we had faculty and staff doing the teaching, um, about 100 and uh, reached over a thousand students. So that was a really great way to start organizing. And um, at the end of the teaching, we did uh, sort of direct messages down to the Commonwealth, you know, asking for more money. Um, so it got us paying attention, not only to campus finances, but we started showing up to Board of Trustees meetings because they were the decision makers, right? And we wanted to know how they were addressing um, some of these problems. Um, the following year, we decided to continue with the campaign, but this time we called it We Belong Here, and we centered our work more around uh, really inequities, around issues of inclusion, um, how there's a disparate impact of uh, you know, student debt and access to debt on historically marginalized student groups. But within a few months of that campaign kicking off, COVID struck, and we actually were able to channel the energy um, to push back, um, you know, just, just like probably on other campuses, all of a sudden we were facing with real immediate mega cuts coming down, you know, from the Board of Trustees. We we're talking about a retrenchment of up to 10% of our faculty, uh, six weeks of furloughs for all employees. We had a 25% reduction in our part-time staff. Um, and the reasons the Board of Trustees said that these uh, mitigation measures were necessary was because of the projected low occupancy in the dorms from COVID. So that, you know, for, for, at this point, we had like over 100, you know, faculty, staff, and students watching these. We couldn't understand how all of our campus finances are tied to the profitability of our auxiliary services. That's pretty messed up. So we, um, we formed the union, for, formed a small capital assets group. We also had um, a couple of students join in. And um, like Zoe's campus, we just started you know, taking a look at the books that were publicly available. And you know, the information about capital debt wasn't hidden. We took a look at the uh, you know, annual debt service that our campus was paying on our quarter billion dollars worth of campus debt. And what we learned is that, you know, in the span of mm, 10 years, students were paying on average about $500 of their tuition and fees towards the capital service fees. Up to, at that, at that time, it was about $3,000 of their fees were paying the campus's capital debt. So essentially, it was an aha moment where we realized that the, the loans that our university was taking out for campus buildings and renovations were being paid for by the students and um, in the injustice of that. So um, we started our journey here at a local level. 
And while the organizing, honestly, you know, during the pandemic, it felt good to be doing something than doing nothing. Um, our impact was pretty insignificant. The only way that we could really address what our board of trustees called our structural deficit was to take on, you know, um, uh, take to scale up the effort. Right? We needed it. We couldn't do this alone. And so, Rich, we'll talk a little bit about the scaling up. Thanks, Joanna. Um, the only other aspect of what happened, you know, on the campus stuff, just because of history of few and all of that, was to say what we did was basically not under the leadership of the union, shall we say. We did this independently within the union or parallel to the union or wild caddy, and we weren't always welcomed by the leadership. Initially, it was okay. Subsequently, it was less so. Um, but what was really critical, as Joanna was saying, is because we were linked up to out-of-state networks like FEW, we were able to link up with folks who helped us get a wider perspective on debt um, and also um, provided the mutual support, both in knowledge and in perspective, but also we were meeting once a week with th this group and it was just really energizing. And if one person was down, the other four, four people were being supportive. And I don't want to ignore that human element of having a support group as really critical. Um, that group then with Joanna and I in it started organizing for the April 15th Debt Reveal Day. You know, we all came up with a easy to use worksheet um, for analyzing debt on campus uh, step by step. We came up with what Zoe talked about, the notion of instructional harm, how many services are lost um, because of debt payments. Um, we also started to increasingly um, integrate into our discussions the invisible factors, the not only the role that rating agencies play, but how they play it. <laughs> what are the criteria? <clears throat> the stronger your union, the lower your credit rating, just to be overt about that. And hearing, seeing that in print is pretty incredible. We also got out of this group the fact, the clarification that debt is a power relationship. It's a financial relationship, but more critically, it's a power relationship. And so we're constantly in this, not just to understand debt, but to create power on campuses and across the country, first to clarify the issue and then to try and transform it. So in Massachusetts, we're trying now to move on to a statewide project of revealing campus debt on all the campuses. And it's pretty hard, um, given all the stresses that people are under from COVID and austerity and everything else. It's hard to find people who are interested and have time to organize for what's still an obscure issue for a lot of people. So relying on the combination of people who've drawn, been drawn into this issue, and a lot of them are sporadic. They'll come and do stuff for two months and then not be able to do stuff. But keeping up the contact, they keep coming back. Um, with our work to date, the support of the cross um, state networks like FEW, our little group, you know, the um, other college debt, which is running this has been growing. We've been continuing throughout Massachusetts with one-on-one -on -one conversations, building up what we've accomplished. We're trying to reach out on campuses, really critical is building alliances with students, setting up email lists. We have an informal email list of 170 faculty members. Um, we didn't set it up, but we can communicate with two thirds of the faculty through that. Uh, we set up group me's for instant messaging during board meetings when people are otherwise isolated and just screaming at their screens. Um, you know, we've been publishing op-eds in the local media and we've been building the debt into other struggles. So when we write an op-ed about furloughs, we link it back to debt. When we write an op-ed about X, we link it back to debt. Um, we've been publishing articles in the union statewide publications. 
We've been um, going to national workshops of activists um, and unions, um, largely through Eleni's skills. We've got stuff in the nation. We've got stuff in labor notes. Um, and we even got something in the AAUP's Journal of Academic Freedom for those who like the academic -y type of stuff. But in all of this, there have been a few underlying principles. We're not understanding debt in order to publish snazzy articles and to build up our own prestige, but to build power, right? And as somebody else, as Joanna said, other folks said, that means not being specialists caught up in the details, but knowing enough to be dangerous. And that means talking to people one by one, time and time again, starting where they are, not where we are. You know, start with questions. Developing networks on our campus and beyond. And from those, we learn new strategies, insights, methods of outreach. And we also get the support to keep ourselves going. Always focusing on building power. That's what it's really about. And that takes time. And one of the things that sustains us is looking back to see how far we've come. You know, two years ago, we started with the teach-in. Recently, a couple of months ago, our local president, who's not generally aligned with us, confronted the administration's narrative about a structural deficit by saying the key element of the deficit was not faculty salaries, not waste, but campus debt. And that became part of the conversation, and they can't take it back, right? Um, Today, Max Page, the vice president of the Mass Teachers Association, who is on his way here, we think, uh, told us that this debt stuff now pervades a lot of their outreach to legislators. When they're talking to legislators about funding, they say, every time you put more money into building university construction, that's less student debt. And that's a connection that they wouldn't have made before. Um, so we look at these victories, small and medium, and they really help us and these groups to keep going. So I'm going to stop. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rich and Joanna. Um, do any of you have questions uh, for Rich and Joanna? Elizabeth, go for it. Um, and if if this is like too far sideways, like please. Uh, I don't. I don't mean to derail things, but I'm often curious about the role of accreditation in, like, sort of maintaining the perception of the value of a degree, and that's particularly true because I work at like very expensive, like, private colleges, and I'm wondering if there is like an angle or an approach in the way, like, the, what the criteria are that accreditation institutions, because I see them as being very complicit in the current situation. Um, but I don't know if there's like an opening there or not. We we Curious. did try, we did try that on our campus. Um, uh, Salem State got uh, the accreditation came um, just last spring. And so we very much tried to talk about how our finances were just in total disarray and needed to be addressed and needed to be addressed from our Commonwealth and, and um, talk about the ways in which we can't take on any more capital debt. Like that means no new buildings, no new buildings. And um, we wrote directly to you know, the, 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 the chair of the team. We spoke with them at the meetings um, and you know, when their report they applauded our board of trustees and our CFO for managing the pandemic so well, completely deaf to our conversations. Uh, they are not an ally. They're worried that they, they wanna make sure that our students can pay back their debt that they take on because the federal loans, right, are provided by our government. The rates are way too high and they wanna make sure those loans get paid back. All right. Are there any other quick questions for Rich and Joanna? Thank you so much, Rich and Joanna. So just again, like these are different ways that people are already organizing on different in different parts of the country. And now we want to hear um, really quickly from some of the initial efforts 
that are being undertaken in Colorado by Tracy and her comrades. So Tracy, uh, a few words on that, please. Sure, so I'll go really quick. Um, I, uh, Rich and Joanna and the work at Salem State have been a real inspiration to us um, at the University of Colorado and um, Eleni's work um, and the articles that she has published were honestly what drew us into this conversation about institutional debt. So um, this is a group of people that I'm really happy to be working with. Um, and we kind of started from a perspective of uh, having done an anti-austerity training um, as a union and have having a group of people who wanted to research our budget and our finances and um, kind of see where, as the university was making these announcements about COVID um, and the budget cuts that were coming as a result of COVID, um, what was really happening in the budget and the finances? And it turned out to be really important for us to look at debt, among other things. Um, and so we started doing research um, on the finances and looking at like the, the annual financial reports from uh, the University of Colorado, which are available easily online. There are these hundred plus page documents that uh, have an incredible wealth of information if you start looking through them and um, getting people interested in this top in these topics because it's really a, a very wide range of things that you can research once you start looking at austerity poli policies and budget and debt um, was kind of our first phase of, of activism and getting people involved um, so we could assign people to you know research hey can you find out this statistic for the University of Colorado or for this specific campus um, and then we published the questionable decisions report which I will um, put a link to in the chat. Um, and that is, uh, was the result of the first few months of research. And, um, from the beginning, we were aware, Hey, this is going to take more than, um, a couple of months. So we are currently working on our second round of this report, which, um, brings me to the, the third bullet point, don't stop. Um, we definitely had a lot of a, sl a, sl a bit of a slowdown um, over the summer um, with people off campus, people going and doing research. Um, our uh, large proportion of people in our union who are uh, grad workers um, kind of transitioning out, new people transitioning in and people with new interests coming in and we're, we're shifting um, our focus a little bit to um, taking it back to the basics and confronting the myths that uh, we talked about in our last session and um, specifically the idea that um, this is just how the system works um, and this is how public funding works. So we're going back to looking at uh, public funding for universities nationwide and in Colorado and trying to do some political education around hey, this is not how this used to be. Um, this is not how this needs to be. This needs to be different. Um, and uh, kind of going back to that and then also going um, deeper into looking both at debt and what's being funded by debt and what's being funded um, through our investments as a university. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave it there. And then uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Tracy. Does anyone have any questions for Tracy in the Colorado system? Okay, so we wanted to give you some like practical material stuff that can get you started. And we have crafted a cheat sheet of like how to start around debt organizing on your campus or in your state. Um, and on that cheat sheet is not only some organizing tips, but also <clears throat> some ways to talk about some of these common debt myths that keep people from organizing. And so to go over that, I'm gonna turn it over to our friend, Eleni, and she's gonna lead you through some of the key points of this worksheet that we hope you share very, very widely on as many different platforms and with as many different people as possible. So Eleni, it's all you. Hey, everybody. Um... 
this is super in inspiring and exciting. And basically I have the boring part of taking all of the really cool, awesome stories that everybody just presented that was like born of flesh, blood, and sweat. And we put it on a PDF <laughs> for you all. Um, whatever, we do what we can. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen quickly. Uh, or maybe I don't need to. You Basically, we'll go through this quick. Uh, Tracy and I both dropped in the chat um, a PDF that you can look at that basically captures what we think are some of the key points um, of, of this work that we're doing. And really, really, truly with an eye towards the most important question, which is how to get started. Because so much of this issue is incomprehensible. I am um, going to hazard a guess that none of us here would describe ourselves as financial experts of any degree. Um, and in fact, I take the position that that is exactly our credential to be working in this space uh, because it is too often relegated to um, the work of, of sort of wonks and technocrats who are telling us what needs to happen for our students and our colleagues. Um, so just really quickly, the document basically works in, in two parts, let's say. The first part is about basically steps to get started. And as folks have just said, you know, that just there's, there's, you know, some text in here. I think we're all in agreement that this is probably a draft and we're going to look forward to updating this down the road as we all continue to deepen and broaden this work. But some of the first things, you know, come with organizing as a team um, to not try to do this alone. <laughs> Um, and if you have one other, one other buddy doing this with you, well, boom, you've got your team. Um, and to approach the research itself as part of the organizing. So that, those two points are really connected to each other. Um, asking these kinds of questions is, is, is when done in an open, transparent way is actually can be part of the organizing tasks. Um, so then I guess that there's some ideas of once you've begun organizing and figuring out some of the details of some of the basic facts of how much debt your university owns, how does, I think one of the things, you know, there's, there's more to talk about on the technicalities of this, but the worksheet that was shared in the chat that, that Rich created um, is really, really helpful. And one of the things that that worksheet helps does is it draws into light the proportions that debt is used compared to other things on campus. And I think that for, for me, that was really eye-opening because I have a hard time kind of comprehending what's $300 million of a university budget. But when I understand that that's, you know, more than student services or less than the police department, it helps me kind of gauge proportionately what this means for a university budget. So that's a little, a top trick. Um, we have some ideas on here about teaching series and how to start building public facing conversations about what you're finding. Um, and to think about what are some of the long and short-term demands around debt. So, so you know, we're, we're unlikely to abolish debt in any of our single campaigns, probably this year, probably next year, <laughs> but we can start to make demands about how to make the, if, if our universities do have to borrow money, how to make the, how to borrow money in ways that minimize the instructional harm um, and that can, can not have our workplaces and our sites of learning be also places of extraction for corporate profit. So we have some ideas about that. The second part of the document is, draws from the session that we did last month about myths around debt. So one of the challenges that we found, and this is sort of a gesture to how we opened our, our time together tonight, is that there's so often we have ingrained in our head that debt is sort of naturalized in a certain way um, and that it kind of usually functions around a set of have to's. I have to pay this. Um, I'm, you know, oftentimes with some kind of moral things. And so one of the challenges as we organize around debt is to break down these myths. So in this document, we've kind of jotted down what we think are some of the top myths, top, you know, top four myths that keep our society locked in debt. And we've got the econ some of the economic arguments we sort of, we list what these arguments are, why we think these are actually myths and not truths, and how you can work on reframing them. So we encourage you all, it, it's a little pedantic and too late to walk through this step by step, but um, trust you all will have thoughts on this and that we can 
um, incorporate revisions and updates on this. This is a, I, 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 and I, I hope my colleagues agree with me. I think they do. We'll, we'll see this as a living document. So what we want to do in our final minute, any questions on this? I'm going to stop screen sharing so I can see everybody more easily. Um, any questions on this document right off the bat? Or thoughts? Um, I think we have a few final minutes to jump into breakout sessions to basically work through this, you know, really what this whole session is about and what, you know, folks have shared with us and what this document is trying to put in paper form is how do we get started doing this work? And what are the kinds of, how do we start drawing people together? What are the first steps we can take? What are the resources that can sustain us? And so, um, we're gonna go into breakout groups for a couple of minutes and just to begin to think about this of like, what is it that you see? Where are some of the places that you think you can get started? If you've been doing this work already, what are the next steps to, to on the journey? What are the next conversations you want to have and, and how, how can you, who can you draw together to have those conversations? Um, what are some of, you know, you're also, if you're just reading this document for the first time and want to talk about a particular myth, for example, that you find really uh, limiting on your campus, like how do you want to tackle that particular myth or a, a, a act? Some, anyways, that's 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 what we're going to be doing in, in breakouts now. Um, so I'll go ahead and open the rooms, and uh, let's take at least ten, maybe twelve minutes. Um, and actually, I'm going to. Some people have had to jump off, so I'm just going to move a few of you around here so that we have. Uh... All right, see you in a little bit. <laughs> 